Maybe about 3,000 years people have lived. 3,000 years? Around this area. You see the church right in the middle. I've actually driven up on the top here trying to get a parking space. Do you think I could find one? No chance. I went past two times just thinking. But you can see some cars are parked there. But probably not for a tourist. Yeah, so this O-R-T-E, Orte. from Venice to Rome. A lack of time is a disadvantage when traveling on a tight schedule to many countries, but it is a wonderful advantage when comparing the history and or landmarks. An example is learning the columns of Piazza San Marco are from the east. Similarly, when traveling to Paris, we will learn that the obelisk is from Egypt. This may seem meaningless to you, but I will explain as we travel and see new sites. Upon arriving in Rome, we walk down narrow streets before seeing any landmarks. Do you recognize the obelisk in the distance? Obelisks are four-sided structures that were typically erected in commemoration of the rulers, yet originated in ancient Egypt. A true obelisk is of solid stone. In other words, the Washington Monument is the tallest obelisk, but it is hollow so it's not a true obelisk in its purest form. Rome has 13 obelisks, making it the city with the most obelisks in the world. This is the Obelisco Salustiano, Salustiano Obelisk in English. It is where we will discuss some of Rome's diverse history. Let's start with the uniqueness of the Salustiano obelisk in that while Egyptian in origin, it is not a pharaonic obelisk. The hieroglyphs along the sides were engraved in Rome. Moreover, they are copies of the hieroglyphs of the obelisk of Ramses II that stands in the Piazza del Popolo. If you learned a foreign language, you can understand why the carvings of the hieroglyphs was rather poor and inaccurate. This obelisk is 2,000 years old. Now that we've talked about the non ferric obelisk, let's discuss the area. It stands atop the Spanish steps, Scalinata di Triente de Monti, and in front of the church of Santissima Trienta de Monti. Spanish steps in Rome? An Italian country? Did you know that Rome had Spanish ties? What do you think is perched atop the Spanish steps in the Italian city of Rome? Would you guess a French church? A French church in Rome? Wow, this is diverse. Santissima Trinita de Monti, also referred to as Trinita de Monti, is the church at the top of the Spanish steps. It is one of five French-speaking Catholic churches of Rome. Yes, Trinta de Monti, also called La Trinta de Mons, is a French church maintained by France. The convent founded by the Francesco di Paola in 1494 and financed by the crown of France, stands on the right side of the church. There was once a vineyard there where the church stands, but it was donated to an order of friars by French King Charles VIII. The church itself was built between 1502 and 1519. Yes, the property where the church stands belongs to the French. The land below, the Spanish square, or Piazza di Spagna, housed the Spanish embassy which was owned by Spain. Construction in the area in between, the Pincian Hill, where the Spanish steps climbed to the church, was accomplished, but not without opposition. It is amazing 
when you reflect upon your school days and hearing about the Roman Empire so often to learn that the French and Spanish had interests and struggles regarding the territory of Italy. With peace between France and Spain, the French wanted to create a symbolic connection between the two countries in Rome. So, stairs climbing the dirt hill could bridge the two countries in a foreign country. Scalinata di Trinta de Monti, or in English, the stairway to the church of Trinta de Monti, is a 135 step staircase funded by France to connect the Spanish Square to the Trinta de Monti. Negotiations began in mid 1600s. However, it would take about 100 years with different kings and popes, of course, to resolve and finally design and build the staircase, which is the widest staircase in Europe. At the base of the Spanish steppe lies the Fountain della Fracaccia. Its construction was part of a city plan to place fountains at the center of Rome's main squares to celebrate the restoration of the notorious Aqua Virgin Aqueduct. As such, a low, flat bottom river boat designed memorializing Rome flooding during the Christmas of 1598 is rumored to be the inspiration. Seeing people, places, and things in person has an entirely different and lasting effect on us. It seems obvious, but we see places like the Trevi Fountain on TV, on the internet, or even here on my YouTube videos, and feel a little prepared for what we are about to behold in person. However, in reality, it is difficult to fully appreciate. In a moment, I will talk about the Pantheon, and when you first see it, it does not look as impressive as the Trevi Fountain. Put another way, first appearances can be deceiving. The Trevi Fountain is one of the most iconic landmarks in Rome. It has been in films since the 1950s. Of course, this makes it a must-see when visiting Rome. Throwing a coin into the fountain adds to the allure. To give you an idea of the quantity of visitors the fountain receives, imagine collecting $3,000 in coins each day or one and a half million dollars per year. The fountain is massive, measuring 160 feet, 49 meters wide, and 85 feet, 26 meters in height. That is as tall as an eight-story building. Its name originates from its location at the junction of three roads. Tre, V, Tre being three, V being roads, Trevi. While the Trevi Fountain was built in the 18th century, its history began long before this. It started well before a 15th century fountain on the site that was demolished in the 17th century was deemed to be. The Trevi Fountain began with the creation of the Aqua Virgo in 19. B, C, which is now referred to by its Italian name, Aqua Regine. Yes, you can drink the water. As we have already seen with the Spanish Steps and Trinta di Monti, the French church in Rome, Rome's history is vast. That can be seen in Trevi Fountain as well, personifying Rome's dominance and the empire's ability to control water lent to the fountain's theme, taming of the waters. The Romans took much from the Greeks, including their gods. Oceanus, not Neptune, standing at over 19 feet tall, is the central figure in the Trevi Fountain. He was the father god of water especially oceans and rivers. Neptune, who carries a trident, came after 
Oceanus. Oceanus, riding a shell-shaped chariot, is pulled by two seahorses led by tritons. The horse to the right is docile, representing calm seas, while the horse on the left is restless, wild, or agitated, representing rough seas. To the left of Oceanus is the goddess Abudantia, depicted by carrying a cornucopia, horn of plenty. To the right of Oceanus is the goddess Salubrius, the goddess of good health, holding a cup from which a snake is drinking. Standing atop the columns are four goddesses representing Earth's bounty produced from the water. Fruit, crop, harvest, and flowers. Above the goddess Salubrius is a picture-like carving of a young girl indicating the direction of a source of water to Agrippa and his soldiers who were returning from a long battle on a hot summer day and dying of dehydration. As with most legends, the girl was not to be found when Agrippa searched for her after drinking the water and returning to Rome. With no good deed going unpunished, he decided to build an aqueduct from the water source to Rome. Therefore, above the goddess Abudantia is a picture-like carving of the famous Roman army general Agrippa presiding over the construction of the Aqua Virgo. The Aqua Virgo is the only aqueduct that never stopped working and still supplies water to Rome. Aqua Virgo is one of several aqueducts that serve the city of Rome with pure drinking water. But it's not too safe to drink the water from the Trevi Fountain itself since this water is recycled. However, it is the fountain mentioned earlier at the foot of the Spanish Steps. The Palazzo Poli was built in the 16th century. In the 17th century, the residence was purchased in which various extensions, as well as purchasing of adjacent buildings, were incorporated into the construction. Remember, there was a fountain near the Palazzo Poli from the 15th century that was demolished in the 17th century, maybe as a result of the palace expansion projects. Then, in the 18th century, it was decided to incorporate the palace into the new fountain design. As such, the backdrop of the Trevi Fountain is cleverly merged with the southern wall of the Palazzo Poli. While Pope Clement XII was not the first pope to initiate a new fountain, it was Pope Clement XII who succeeded in having the Trevi Fountain being built. Although he died in 1740, it is his coat of arms that rests atop of the fountain. Across the street, and in direct sight of the Trevi Fountain, is a quaint church with a long name. Surprisingly, based on a 400-year practice, the hearts of popes were removed and preserved before embalming the body and placed in the church, where it is home to 22 preserved pope hearts. Just a few additional nuggets about the Trevi Fountain earlier. I mentioned the collection of $3,000 per day from the fountain. This money goes to a Catholic ch charity which helps the less fortunate or needy. Tossing a coin in the fountain is unique for this fountain as there is a specific way. You hold the coin in your right hand and throw it over your left shoulder. Yes, having your back to the fountain is a must in this case. Legend has it that if you throw one coin you will return to Rome. According to a, the films of the 1950s and afterwards, if you throw a second coin, you'll find love. Throwing a third coin means marriage is in the future. It may be superstition, but it's something that tourists still do here today, and they do it a lot. I know I want to return to Rome 
while I saw the fountain, I did not see the church. Well, we are off to see the next landmark. What can you see in the middle of a town that is monumental? We are approaching what appears to be an ordinary building. It is amongst modern buildings of the same height and size. Its notoriety is known all over the world. We have seen the design numerous times in buildings such as the U.S. Capitol, the Jefferson Memorial, and the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. What we are looking at seems like a common, small, dilapidated building of no consequence. Therefore, its magnificence is well hidden until you are at its porch entrance. You see, the Agrippa inscription and a dirty black facade which appears to be a silo of the same color. The neighboring buildings look more presentable. What is so special about this building? You know it is the Pantheon, but what is so impressive about it? It's about twice the size as its Trevi Fountain, which comes across as gigantic which you think looks more massive and more impressive. The building standing before you was not built by Marcus Agrippa. He had been dead for over a hundred years, and he was never an emperor. So why was such an important building named after him? This is uncommon. It was uncommon. Before Marcus Agrippa died in 12 BC, he built the original Pantheon which shared his name. Pantheon means honoring all gods, which, if you remember, was a major part of Roman culture. Agrippa incorporated the gods of his, in his design. Unlike other monuments, Agrippa's original Pantheon was not destroyed with the intent of building a greater monument, but unfortunately, it was destroyed by a fire in 80 AD. Hadrian built the Pantheon that we see today around 126 AD, while he was the emperor. His decision to inscribe the building with Agrippa's name is a mystery, but a thought is for political reasons. Naming the building after the original building was a sign of humility, which would have been seen by the emperor's subject as having compassion. As we move closer to the Pantheon, we begin to see its impressiveness. On the porch, you stand next to columns, which are 39 feet, 12 meters tall, five feet, or one and a half meters in diameter. This means you could sleep on the column base, or that it's the size of your mattress. Viewed another way, stand up and stretch out your arms to each side. It would take four people like this to wrap their arms around the column. The height is taller than two Tyrannosaurus rexes, or the length of a school bus. After the columns, you pass through two huge bronze double doors. Each is seven and a half feet wide, or two and a half meters, and 24 feet, seven meters high. Moreover, they are perfectly balanced such that a single person can easily open or close the doors. If you think this is amazing, wait till you, we enter the building. While it appears the same size as the modern building it neighbors, we enter a single open chamber with a high ceiling and all the glitter and glamour you can imagine. The Pantheon interior is about the size of half a football field. To best illustrate this, which looks bigger? An outdoor football field or an indoor football field? The field itself is the same size, but our eyes perceive objects differently because of our familiarity and surroundings. We see the outdoors every day. Going to school, work, or shopping. Putting this into perspective, the outside columns of the Pantheon, the size of a school bus, the 
we do not appreciate the enormity of this. One object is horizontal and the other is vertical. Remember, it takes four people with outstretched arms to encircle the column, and they are 39 feet tall. Imagine them laying down. Four of these columns laying down would fit into the Pantheon. Now, imagine four school buses in a line. Taking that a little further, imagine 20 of them side by side as well. Let's go back outside for a moment. The letters look as though they are about the size of your hand. What if I told you they're as tall as you? The Pantheon interior is a single room measuring 142 feet, 43 meters in diameter, and 142 feet, 43 meters in diameter in the center. Do you remember in your high school history and literature classes studying about the Greek and Roman gods? I even demonstrated disregarding the Trevi fountain design. Today, word definitions vary. For instance, Pantheon can refer to all gods or a specific few of the people stemming from the Greek words pan, meaning all, and theos, meaning gods. However, using the to a specific people, it is believed that Rome's Pantheon meant all the gods of the Julian and Caldarian era, rather than all the gods in general. We think this because Agrippa built the original pantheon, he dedicated it to Mars and Venus. These were the mythological gods of the julio Claudian family. The significance of this today is that in 609 AD, Christians transformed the pantheon into a church, St. Mary of the Martyrs. In other words, the pantheon a building dedicated to mythological deities became a place of worship for Christians, which is still the case today. As such, it is the first Roman pagan temple to be consecrated as a Christian church. Additionally, after its conversion, it also became the final resting place of Renaissance fi figures such as Italian kings, poets, and the artist Raphael. With the transformation into a Christian church, marble statues, decorations, altars, and tombs inside the Pantheon are not original. Most were added during the Renaissance, but there are some from the 19th and the 20th century. Here we see the tomb of Raphael, the first artist receiving such an honor. Raphael is best known for his Madonnas, the Blessed Mother works, and for painting in the Vatican. But that, that is for another video. His influence is seen here with the sculpture of the Virgin Mary and Child, the Madonna del Sasso, by one of his pupils. Vittorio Emanuele II, the first king of United Italy, is also buried in the Pantheon. Pantheon had the world's largest dome for over 1,300 years, which I will discuss later in the video. I mention this now because without it becoming the church, the Pantheon may not exist or resemble the Colosseum, a ruins. Put another way, the conversion of the Pantheon to a Christian church is why it is one of the most preserved ancient structures in the world today, definitely in Rome, for almost 2,000 years. In 330, the Roman Empire capital moved from Rome to Byzantium, modern-day Istanbul, Turkey, in which it fell into a long period of disrepair. In 476, Rome was conquered by Germany, continuing the decline of the Pantheon. Luckily, in 609, Pope Boniface IV got permission from the Byzantine Emperor to convert the Pantheon into a Christian church. The papacy 
repaired and maintained the magnificent building you see today. Catholic Mass is held there regularly to this day. Have you ever wondered how they built the pyramids of Egypt? Do you remember me talking about the difficulty in erecting the columns of Piazza San Marco in Venice? Now, try to imagine the erecting of columns of the Pantheon 1,500 years earlier. While the Pantheon had the world's largest dome for 1,300 years, it remains the world's largest unsupported dome. Imagine your car on the roof of your house. We can, but it is one car and the roof is supported. When we see a large parking garage at the shopping center or hospital, we see it's fast without paying much attention to the inner support system. Knowing these garages are sturdy, we take them for granted. If we think about it, it might be that they are 30 years old and there are a lot of cars. That's all we think about. Looking at the Pantheon, with its massive size, we see the inner columns are along the outer perimeter of the dome. This is not supporting the dome, but elevating the dome, adding to the complexity of its design well before modern day equipment. Remember using dominoes or rocks to build simple towers when you were a child? Now try to imagine lifting a car onto one of the columns and then stacking the cars or building something the size of a car above, high above the ground. This dome weighs as much as 1,200 vehicles or 5,000 tons and is unsupported. That is a monumental feat, pun intended. As an engineer, you can appreciate the physical aspects of the Pantheon. Similarly, the architect and historian can marvel at the details that went into the design of the building. At the top center of the dome exists a 28-foot diameter opening, an oculus. It allows natural light to enter the building and is still used for that today. Although the Pantheon is a tourist destination, there exists little electrical lighting in the facility. Other than the oculus, the entrance doors are the only other source of natural lighting for the building. Representing the days of the lunar month are 28 coffers. This pattern is created five times, known for the five planets at the time. The ingenuity of the coffers is their weight reducing characteristic that aided in the ability to construct a massive dome without support. Therefore, the masons meticulously carved out 140 waffle-like depressions. More than unsupported, it is also unreinforced, unlike the roads, bridges, and garages of today. Autumn, winter, and summer are represented by four rectangular exedrae, with seven interior niches. The days of the week are symbolized. Unsure whether by design or by luck, engineers say that the niches and chambers are the reason the Pantheon remains intact today. All buildings undergo settling, and the Pantheon is no different. Cracks have developed in the niches and chambers. If you remember, the dome rests on the interior columns along its perimeter. Had the cracks reached the dome, it most likely would have toppled since it is unsupported and unreinforced. Did you notice how the marble is of different colors? It is from various conquered provinces of Rome. What do you think happens when there is a big gaping hole in the ceiling? Yes, the inside gets wet from the rain. You do not notice it, but the floor is not level. It is pitched to allow for the easy draining of the rain or water. Water, because way back when, the nearby river flooded. Now, which do you think looks more impressive? 
the Trevi Fountain or Pantheon. Next time, we will see the Vatican and the Colosseum. If you do not know, the Colosseum is one of the new seven wonders of the world.